Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the real-time measurement and manipulation of single molecule interaction from DNA binding proteins to cytoskeletal motors program. I'm Tiffany Willoughby, program manager in the Office of Research at UT Dallas. Joining me to lead today's session is Dr. Evan Gates. Evan Gates obtained his Bachelor's of Science degrees in mechanical and biomedical engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. He then obtained a PhD in biomedical engineering from Duke University, where he was a NSF graduate research fellow. His thesis work under Dr. Brenton D. Hoffman involved the use of FRET based tension sensors to study molecular mechanisms of cell adhesion and migration. Since 2020, Evan has been an application scientist for Lumix, helping investigators unlock the power of dynamic single molecule research. Dr. Gates, the virtual platform is yours. Today, I'm talking about the real-time measurements and manipulation of single molecule interactions. Uh, from DNA binding proteins to cytoskeletal motors. So we'll be covering a range of topics. Um, at various points, feel free to um, put your questions in the chat, um, raise your hand to ask questions, um, and I'll, I'll try and answer them along the way. So as Tiffany said, um, I am currently an application scientist for Lumix. Uh, I began as a mechanical engineer at Carnegie Mellon. I became interested in biology, and so I decided to pursue a PhD in biomedical engineering at Duke University, um, where I worked in a lab, uh, the Hoffman lab, where I studied things like cell adhesion, mechanics, and mechanotransduction using these FRET-based tension sensors uh, that essentially allow you to measure forces across individual proteins um, in living cells. Um, and from there, I used that knowledge um, and furthered my tool set by joining Lumix um, with the, the cutting edge technology that they offer. So for today's talk, um, I first want to discuss why you should be interested in dynamic single molecule research. You know, how can it benefit the work that you're doing? Um, then I would like to introduce what is a C-trap? Uh, what is our instrument? What does it do? And how does it enable you to study dynamic single molecule processes? Thirdly, and, and where I'll spend most of my time, is discussing what our customers have done. So what are the research applications? Um, what processes can you explore? And fourthly, um, research support. So what does Lumix do to help you go from the ideation phase to getting results? Um, you know, we work hard to reduce any friction um, so you, that you can get your results quicker, faster, and easier. So to begin, uh, discussing why single molecule research, I want to begin with an example from Dr. Stephen Chu, who has a Nobel Prize in physics and some of the fields we'll be talking about today. Um, and Dr. Chu famously joked the average person, uh, on the, you know, if you look at the, the world as a whole, uh, has just one ovary and one testicle, uh, which is an absurd claim when you look at the individual level. So uh, on the left here, I, I want to, you know, really hone this in on, on biological systems, right? Um, so when you look at a process such as DNA replication um, shown in the video, we see that there's many proteins involved, um, and this process is both spatially and temporally heterogeneous. Um, so you can see that proteins are coming in, they're changing conformations, um, their activity is changing again in space and time. And so as a researcher, when you approach these types of processes to ask questions, you often have um, two different routes you can go. Um, the first one shown at the top right here is to look at the structures. So there are tools like cryo-EM, x-ray crystallography, and others that enable you to look at their structures, but these provide just a snapshot, um, and they often miss rare or transient events. Now, the second approach is to look at the uh, functional assays. Um, so these are things like in vitro character characterizations um, in test tubes, uh, maybe running something on a Western gel, or looking at fluorescent reporters in a cell. Um, the issue here is that uh, while useful, they, they give you a bulk average or an unsynchronized average of all the contributions. Um, so the question is, how do you link structure um, to function uh, when you're missing um, the dynamic uh, single molecule aspects? 
And so to drive this point home further, I want to take maybe a closer look at an example related to DNA binding proteins. So let's say you're interested in something like a DNA helicase. Where you know the structure from something like cryo-EM or X-ray crystallography, and you know the function perhaps by exposing that helicase with maybe a cofactor um, to DNA and then running it on a gel to see um, the resultant product. But you don't necessarily know which steps um, the helicase takes to get from point A um, to point B. You know, does it go pathway one or pathway two? And so to do that, um, to make breakthrough discoveries, uh, we believe that you need to do several things. Uh, the first is that you need direct proof of how the molecular mechanism works. You also then need to observe the stepwise assembly of the biological complex, right? So does your helicase mount onto DNA, begin to unwind the DNA, and then require a cofactor to translocate? Or is it maybe slightly different? Uh, does the cofactor come in before that protein uh, can mount to the DNA? Um, and then the DNA can subsequently translocate along the DNA. Finally, to test many of these questions, you need to be able to modulate the molecular system um, to, to test the hypothesis under different conditions, right? So how does this process change? Maybe if you change salt concentrations, um, if you expose it to ATP, um, or maybe if you use a mutant of the protein, you want to be able to control all of those steps. So in theory, it would be great if you could test the mechanism by one, directly visualizing the location and dynamics of your individual proteins, as shown here. Two, uh, having control over the stepwise assembly of the biological complex. Because like we saw um, in the movies on the previous page, uh, there can be many uh, proteins involved in a single process. And thirdly, it would be great if you could manipulate the structure of your system, in this case DNA, uh, and be able to quickly change the environmental conditions of the molecular complex. So that is where our instrument, the C-TRAP, comes in. So the C-TRAP enables you to manipulate, to measure, and to visualize single molecule interactions. And it does that by combining three core technologies, which are an imaging modality, uh, a microfluidic stage top, and optical traps. I'll explain in a second what all these are, um, but essentially this instrument enables you to study a range of dynamic single molecule applications. So on the left here, we have DNA binding proteins. So you can look at processes related to DNA transcription, um, translation, similarly any RNA processes. Then in the next column, you have protein dynamics. Um, so you can look at how um, the conformation and function of proteins change, um, as well as other biomolecules. Um, Thirdly, you can look at processes related to cellular structure and transport. So we have researchers looking at cytoskeletal filaments, looking at molecular motors like myosin, uh, dynein, penicin. And then finally, uh, probing even like the membrane um, or receptors on cells themselves. The fourth column here, protein droplets and phase separation has become a very popular area um, as the field um, of science has, has come to appreciate that um, the compartmentalization and regulation of cellular uh, functions can be regulated by liquid-liquid phase separation, not necessarily these, these organelles as is uh, traditionally thought. So I'll get into those in detail um, later in the talk, but first I want to walk you through these three components that make up the C-TRAP. Uh, the first one being the imaging. So the imaging modality is either a convocal with or without super resolution stead, or it can be a wide field turf setup. So on the left here, we have the confocal. Um, this is a convergent beam that typically has a pinhole to give you a high signal to noise ratio. Uh, we have designed it with um, photo detectors that have single photon sensitivity, so you can visualize individual proteins in your system. Um, and it's a, a scanning confocal, so you can do a point scan. Uh, you can do a 1D line scan or you can scan across uh, to create a 2D image. Um, and the downside here is that with these uh, scanning 2D images, it uh, is a slower acquisition time. Now, uh, when localization is really important and you, you need those really fine details, you can upgrade this to uh, STED, which stands for Stimulated Emission Depletion. Uh, it's a super resolution techniques, 
technique that is nice because it does not require any special um, sample treatment, unlike maybe some of your other uh, super resolution techniques. Uh, the downside here is that you just have a much higher and more complex increment. Um, I'll touch on why you might use one um, modality over the other uh, as I go through the talk. But on the right here, we also have wide field and turf imaging. Uh, so wide field uses a, an SCMOS camera. Um, it provides you fast imaging deep into the solution. Um, however, it doesn't have that pinhole and convergent beam to, to reduce background signal like the pinhole does. And then if you're interested in processes at the surface, uh, you may really be interested in turf uh, or total internal reflection microscopy. Uh, which gives you really high signal to noise ratio um, for anything at the surface of your sample. Um, however, uh, as shown in red, you can't necessarily image deep into your sample. So the second component is the microfluidic uh, stage top. This enables you to flow in your reagents um, in a controlled manner and then alter environmental conditions. So our microfluidic device is called the Uflux. It is a pressure-driven uh, five-channel system. Um, so you can see these syringes where you load your samples. Uh, the pressure pushes it through um, some actuators that control whether or not flow is entering the flow cell, um, which is shown here. Um, you can't really make out the fine details, uh, but this is what goes on the stage um, to allow you to image and conduct your experiment. Um, everything here is automated, um, and the flow cells themselves are reusable. I should also add that these five channels, when they enter this chip, they form um, one big chamber, and there's nothing mechanical uh, or physical separating these channels. There's no walls. Um, instead, what occurs um, in these microfluidic devices, you get laminar flow, so you don't get mixing between the channels. Uh, we get a lot of questions of this. So my colleagues um, made a video that's kind of neat. Uh, I'll pause it here just to show you what's going on. So here are your five channels. Um, you have one, two, three entering one main channel, and then a fourth and a fifth channel um, that are auxiliary. And uh, each channel was filled with a different dye, and I hope what you can appreciate is, is right now flow is going through these channels and they're not mixing, right? You don't get purple and yellow mixing with you know red and, and blue. Um, and I'll play this video and you'll see that you can open and close the, the channels upstream um, to modulate what is entering uh, your system. So here you close the red channel, you see it disappears. Um, you close the second channel with that light yellow, and then you can open them back up and you don't get mixing um, through this process. This is basically, this is just really useful for flowing in your reagents to assemble those uh, complex biological structures. Okay, the third component, which I would guess you've, um, uh, you know the least about, or maybe you've never even heard of, uh, that's your optical traps, um, sometimes called optical tweezers as well. Um, and so some brief history. Uh, while um, people are less likely to know about optical traps or optical tweezers, um, they have been around for many decades. So they were pioneered by Dr. Arthur Ashkin uh, while he was a researcher at Bell Lab. So this was in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, um, and I think even 90s. So along with... Um, co-workers, uh, he showed that you could trap particles uh, across a, a range of sizes, so nanometer to micron. Um, and they were able to demonstrate that you could capture atoms, molecules, organelles, uh, microspheres, and even cells. And for this pioneering work, he was given a, a Nobel Prize in, in 2018. So maybe you're wondering, uh, what exactly are these optical traps and tweezers used for? Uh, well, you trap small particles uh, using light, as the name suggests, optical tweezers. Um, and on the C-trap, you can trap anything on the order of about 100 nanometers to about 10 microns. Uh, so that enables you to manipulate structures. But you can also um, use this technology to measure both small displacements and small forces. So things on the order of sub-nanometer um, to sub-picoNewton up to hundreds of picoNewtons. Uh, why this is incredibly useful is because if we look at biological um, motor proteins or structures, uh, we see this is the right scale. So looking at DNA polymerase, for example, it can exert forces of about 34 piconewtons. Things like kinesin motors or even myosin motors are on the order of uh, individual piconewtons. And then if you look at like the structure of DNA, uh, 
It has about a 3.4 nanometer uh, twist uh, to that double helical structure. And then your kinesin motor uh, has step size of about eight nanometers. So using our instrument, you can then suss out all of these biophysical um, variables. So then what is the, the physical principle of how optical tweezers work? Um, well, let's give the example of where you have uh, a particle such as a bead with a refractive index higher than the surrounding medium. And so the classical example here is something like a glass or polystyrene bead in water. Um, so glass or polystyrene has a refractive index, uh, or polystyrene has a refractive index of about 1.5, I'm thinking now, and water is 1.33, uh, so it's larger. What this means is when a photon comes in and hits this bead, it becomes uh, reflected or refracted upon both entry and exit. So the photon that is exiting the bead is at a different trajectory than when it entered the bead. And so this is a change in momentum. Uh, in classical physics, you may have learned um, that momentum is a change of mass times velocity, um, or you know mass times a change in velocity. Um, but really, momentum comes from energy. And while photons are massless, they do have energy. And so that's where this change in momentum comes from. And if we relate this to Newton's law of energy conservation, we know that this change in momentum of that photon uh, equates to an equal but opposite force on the bead itself. So in principle, uh, how do we use this, um, this knowledge to then trap a particle? Well, as it turns out, uh, work done by Arthur Ashkin showed that if you focused a light beam um, through a typical microscope objective uh, with a high refractive index, you create a gradient of light um, where you're shooting, you know, hundreds of thousands of photons through this bead, and it results in a net momentum that pulls the bead to an equilibrium position uh, right around the focal uh, plane of the objective. So if you don't believe me uh, or you don't quite understand what I'm uh, talking about, here is a cool video where you'll see an out of focus polystyrene microsphere um, pulled into an optical trap. So you can't see the optical trap, uh, but this is a bright field image. And so you can see very quickly that bead is pulled into that equilibrium position. Uh, and, and the video is just going to keep looping. Uh, and if nothing acts on that bead, it just sits at the equilibrium position. That's how you trap objects. How then do you detect forces and displacements? Um, well, the key here is that when you're shining that light up through an objective, it traps the particle. And then if you have a condenser above, you can collect the light onto a PSD or a position sensitive detector. And something like a biomolecule, uh, like a motor protein, or perhaps a cell acts on this bead and displaces it from that equilibrium position. This causes um, the light to displace on the position sensitive detector, uh, enabling you to measure those sub nanometer displacements. And because this light beam has a Gaussian profile, it means that the optical trap works as a Hookean spring. Uh, so a, a spring is described by the equation F equals uh, K delta X. So if you know the stiffness of the optical trap, then any small displacement um, equates to a force that you can easily calculate. So then how do people use this technology to better understand biological systems? I want to give you just a brief overview of um, some prototypical examples. So first, if we're looking at just a single trap, what people have typically done is they've taken something like a motor protein, um, they will conjugate it to a bead through something like a biotin stripped avidin or a ditch anti -ditch, um conjugation technique. And then they will bring that into contact um, with something like a microfilament that that motor can walk on. Um, and using the principles I just showed you, you can measure things like step sizes and forces of that motor protein, uh, which is very valuable. Similarly, people have coated these beads um, with transmem transmembrane receptors or even viral particles, um, brought that into contact with cells and either monitored activity inside the cells or perhaps mechanically perturbed the cells um, to observe cause and effect relationships and better understand uh, the underlying biology. You can get more creative with the more traps you add. Um, so our system, you can have two traps um, as well. What we've seen people do 
uh, with two traps uh, is look at things like DNA binding proteins. So it's very easy to tether a single piece of DNA between two different beads uh, and then monitor the activity of proteins on this DNA tether. Similarly, um, people have done things like form tethers uh, of cytoskeletal fil filaments and then probe to the mechanics of these. So it's almost like a molecular instron uh, machine. Um, enabling, you, enabling you to understand the stress strain mechanics of individual fibers. Uh, we see people looking at uh, protein unfolding, where you tether a protein between two beads, uh, apply a light load, and then see how the conformation of that protein changes. Uh, a new area is looking at phase separation. So here you're not trapping beads, you're actually trapping proteins as they phase separate out of solution, and then looking at things like the fusion of them or the surface tension. Um, similar to protein unfolding, you can also look at RNA structure and use labels um, to measure things like threat simultaneously. So you're getting the complete biophysical and biochemical picture. Um, and then finally here I have uh, a little cartoon of viral processes. So you could have a viral capsid adsorbed or, or conjugated to a bead. And then you can look at that viral capsid, um, the motor protein on that viral capsid pulls on the DNA that's anchored to another bead. Um, to measure both like the processivity um, and the uh, strength of that motor protein. Now the C-trap can also have up to four traps. This just gives you more degrees of freedom to test more complex systems. Um, so the brief example I have here is where you create two DNA tethers and you're looking at maybe um, proteins that cross-link these two DNA um, tethers. So that is our instrument, the C-TRAP, in a nutshell, and those are the three core technologies. Um, so I will begin by going through those uh, four research applications. I don't see any questions. Um, if you do have one, feel free to raise your hand. Um, but otherwise, I will continue. And so the first one on the left here is DNA binding proteins. And I want to begin by talking about CRISPR-Cas9. So you may have heard of CRISPR-Cas in the news. Uh, it was awarded Nobel Prize in 2020, I believe, or 2019. Um, and it's become very popular because it's a very precise um, molecular scissors. Um, so many genetic disorders are caused by mutations in your genome. This is a technology that could potentially be used as a therapeutic to go in, cut out, and repair um, those um, mutated sites. However, the limit to this technology becoming a therapeutic application are off-target effects, right? So you don't want this going in and fixing something that's not broken. And the way specificity is imparted in this CRISPR-Cas system is through something like a guide RNA. So you engineer a specific sequence that's supposed to take it to a matching sequence on your uh, genome. But for unknown reasons, it does not always take you to that correct spot. So we have what I call sea trappers uh, at Imperial College London, and they were looking at this problem and they speculated that maybe the specificity isn't just the sequence, right? It's not just matching the guide RNA to the DNA sequence. It's actually steric interactions uh, or spatial interactions that occur between those two. And really, if you look at DNA packaging, it makes sense. So DNA is a rather stiff um, substance. Um, in some ways, you can think of it maybe as like a as stiff spaghetti. Uh, it has a persistence, persistence length of about 50 nanometers, but it gets wrapped around these histones that are 10 nanometers, right? So it's a rather stiff molecule being wrapped around a much smaller molecule. And so you can speculate uh, that in cells, then uh, when it's wrapped around these nucleosomes, your DNA is subjected to these different forces um, as it's packaged. So they wanted to use this principle um, or this idea to study uh, or, and then use the C-trap to study whether or not um, it could cause off-target binding. And so how do you study that on the C-trap? Um, I have this brief video that will take us through um, the process. It's going to show us a close-up view here of the sample stage, specifically zooming in on the microfluidic flow cell. Like I told you before, it is five channels. Uh, how it's typically set up is in the first channel, you're going to have your beads flowing in. In your second channel, your DNA. And then in the subsequent channels, you'll have your proteins of interest, 
and then a, a buffer or um, empty channel to conduct your imaging. And so first you move to channel one, you turn on your trapping lasers and beads that are flowing by are attracted to those lasers um, and into that equilibrium position. You can then move to your DNA channel and you begin what's called fishing for DNA. So you move the beads close together, you pull them apart and you sense if there's any tension there. Again, similar to fishing. Uh, once you've confirmed that there is a single tether, as this video is showing, you can then move to the third and fourth channel to pick up your proteins of interest. Now, these proteins are typically um, fluorescently labeled. This is something at the end of the talk I uh, can always elaborate on further. But once you've picked up your fluorescently labeled proteins, you move to that buffer channel. Um, in this example, it's going to be a confocal scan where they do that 1D line scan um, over time. It's called a chymograph. Um, and you can look at the behavior of these proteins on the DNA um, over time. Or as you'll see with the CRISPR-Cas9 example, you can look at the location of the proteins uh, over time. So using that, that principle, the video I just showed you, this is exactly what these researchers did. So they flowed in their beads into channel one, their DNA into channel two. They then left a third channel uh, empty. And in a fourth channel, they flowed in their uh, CRISPR-Cas9 that's fluorescently labeled. I should say it's a uh, dead CRISPR-Cas9 that um, behaves just like CRISPR-Cas9 without actually cutting the DNA. And so here's a close-up of the schematic, not quite drawn to scale, but you have your two beads, the DNA tether, and then a CRISPR-Cas9 molecule that's fluorescently labeled binding to the DNA. Uh, what they found initially is that under low forces, you get one characteristic binding location shown here. And I'll play this video. As you see, when they pull to the right, so they're pulling that bead out, which, oops, try that again. So as they pull that bead to the right, they're creating a lot of tension on the DNA. And you can see now that there's a lot of off-target binding of the CRISPR-Cas9 molecules. And it's reversible. As they release the tension, um, they stop binding. So what they did to characterize this is instead of doing a 2D image shown here, they actually did a 1D um, line scan along the backbone over time as they modulated the tension on the tether. So they did um, increasing tension of 20 piganewtons, 30 piganewtons, 40, and 50. I hope what you can appreciate is as the force increases, um, there's more off-target binding uh, effects rather than just that one location it's supposed to. And every time they release the tension um, in between these force ramps, they see that the off-target binding, um, it unbinds and you're left with just the one on-target site. Uh, and what they were to do is go in and look at where it was binding off target and, and what why was that occurring. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details of this paper. It's really cool. Um, you can find it on Nature, Structure, Molecular, Biology. Um, but why this is important, um, I was telling you that they were using dead CRISPR-Cas9. So initially, I think they tried to use live CRISPR-Cas9. And what they were finding is that as you pulled it on DNA, with increasing force, you actually saw increased catalytic activity. Um, so not only does increased tension result in increased uh, nonspecific binding, increased tension results in the Cas9 cutting the DNA more often, uh, which is you know, a huge problem if this is going to be a therapeutic intervention um, used in the clinic. So maybe you're looking at this and you're thinking, how does pooling on DNA relate to nucleosomes? Uh, well, we had some of our sea trappers at Rockefeller University in New York City conduct this really cool experiment uh, where they were able to create a 12-mer of a nucleosome array. Um, so 12 nucleosomes with DNA wrapped around it uh, on this DNA tether between two beads. And they pulled on this um, array and they found that at forces between 10 to 30 piconewtons, you got um, subsequent unwinding of the nucleosomes. Um, so it is um, perhaps relevant to say then that indeed um, these linear forces we're applying to create tension are very similar to the forces uh, exhibited on DNA as it's wrapped around the nucleosomes. Now I won't jump into the details here, um, 
And they didn't really look at it in this paper, but it's very easy using our instrument to look at binding kinetics. Um, so whether you're interested in, in how quickly um, these uh, proteins associate, you can easily do that with these chymographs. Um, if you're looking at how long a repair protein um, stays bound, you can also look at the dissociation constant um, by looking at the, uh, the number of binding events and then the number of unbinding events over a period of time. And I'll also add one more thing. So the data I was showing you in that paper was all done with Confocal. Uh, I had told you that you can upgrade to STED. So we recreated the results in-house. Um, and we found that um, when you get a lot of off-target binding effects, it's hard to differentiate individual binding events. So when you turn on our STED module on the C-TRAP, you indeed can make out these differences. So the STED is incredibly useful when you're studying crowd crowded molecular structures, uh, giving you resolutions down to about 35 nanometers. Um, if you're not familiar, confocal is diffraction limited. And so you'll only be able to resolve structures down to about uh, two to 300 nanometers. So I'll talk about one more uh, example related to DNA replication, uh, sorry, uh, related to DNA binding proteins, and that's how do you study DNA replication. Um, this is another uh, very powerful uh, way to study this process in vitro. And so the way you do that is you apply force. What's interesting uh, about DNA is if, if you take a double-stranded DNA tether and you apply forces of about 65 piconewtons to it, that DNA actually starts to melt. And you get these regions that are now single-stranded um, that can serve as replication forks. Uh, and that's exactly what uh, the labs of Michael O'Donnell and Shishin Liu at Rockefeller University uh, did using the c -trap. They studied this MCM10 CMG helicase complex and how it uh, behaved on DNA. It's, it's important for unwinding the DNA during uh, DNA transcription. And what this looks like, uh, we have this fun cartoon. Uh, so on the left, you have the DNA uh, tethered between two beads. There is tension uh, upon it. So you have a region of single stranded DNA uh, towards the top, and then you have a fluorescent helicase protein on the DNA. And if you scan along the backbone here, creating a chymograph through time, which is being shown here on the right, you can see that as this protein binds, it randomly diffuses along this backbone. To visualize where the single-stranded DNA is, you can flow in a single-stranded DNA marker, um, such as RPA or replication protein A. In this paper, what they found is that <clears throat> this helicase would diffuse until it finally found that replication fork, or this region um, where the or where the single stranded met the double stranded DNA. And then, if you added a second factor, uh, in this example labeled red, it would co-localize with the helicase and begin to unwind the DNA. And if you apply something like an increase in force, it actually lowers the energy barrier and enables that protein to unwind even faster. And then finally, if you move to a channel uh, without ATP, you find that its activity stops. So this is an ATP-driven case. <clears throat> and so that's exactly what these researchers did. Um, I think that cartoon is the easiest way to understand um, how you can use our tool to study these dynamic processes. Um, but they were able to show indeed that when this case switches from single-stranded to double-stranded DNA, it has this change in behavior. Um, they used, uh, they coupled it with some other techniques like FRET to show that it undergoes a conformational change uh, to switch from single stranded to double stranded DNA. And then at the bottom here, this is really the only thing I want to mention on this slide, uh, and it was one of the coolest things. They showed that if you added um, your um, polymerases and other uh, proteins, essentially the minimal replication um, suite of proteins, as well as some fluorescently labeled um, nucleic acids, you would indeed get um, replication to occur, which opens the door for studying a variety of replication-related processes, um, especially related uh, to developing therapeutics. So then, uh, the C-TRAP is a great tool uh, for studying things like DNA replication because it enables you to control the tension on the DNA. Uh, allowing you to manipulate it from double-stranded DNA to single-stranded DNA. 
It enables you to look at these dynamics uh, because you can visualize them in real time. And finally, um, although I didn't really talk about it uh, in these last couple of slides, you use those microfluidics um, to both build your asset. Um, so in this case, sequentially building that replosome and then altering environmental conditions like removing that ATP. With that, I will move on um, to the second area of uh, applications, which are your protein dynamics. So the example I'll talk about in the next couple of slides is ADK kinase. So kinases, as well as many other proteins, um, regulate their activity uh, through structural rearrangements, uh, or really vice versa, right? To uh, enact a different functional uh, result, you maybe need a conformational change. In the case of ADK, it undergoes this change in conformation from about 47 angstroms to 30 angstroms. That's uh, 1.7 nanometers, very small. Um, and using the C-trap, uh, you would tether your protein to two DNA handles um, and then uh, use the beads themselves as handles um, to manipulate that individual protein and better understand the energy landscape um, that dictates the conformational change. So what do you look for when you have this construct set up uh, where you have your protein tethered between two DNA handles? Well, essentially, you you will often begin by applying an increasing amount of force uh, where you see it follow a typical uh, force extension curve. And then at some threshold force, you'll see a dramatic snap in the protein. And that snap corresponds to a conformational change in the protein itself. Uh, it's both a drop in force because it's opening up as well as a uh, displacement. There, what you can do is actually um, take your protein and take a much closer look at that conformational change. Um, so you extend that protein essentially to the cusp of where that conformational change occurs, um, and your protein will fluctuate between two different states. Um, and that gives you a very good idea of what interfaces are interacting. And what is shown in the bottom right here, um, well, I guess I should mention, uh, so this uh, chaotic looking um, bead displacement graph is actually the protein fluctuating between two different states, um, which you can then plot uh, over time and create this histogram of those two different states that the protein, uh, or in this case, the kinase explores. And then down here on the right, um, people have used this information to see how a protein changes conformations in the presence of either uh, different cofactors, uh, different inhibitors, or even different environmental conditions. Now, I want to point out uh, that we often talk about, and you often see in the literature, protein unfolding, but proteins are not the only thing that are conformationally regulated. Um, so many RNA and DNA structures are as well. Um, you can have things like uh, RNA ribose switches. Um, in this case, the authors were looking at tRNA, uh, which is involved in uh, translation. Um, and tRNA is really interesting structure because it has these three hairpins. Uh, the authors were interested in understanding how they all interact and how um, this protein unfolds to understand its behavior. Um, so essentially, and uh, they use the, the concepts I described in the last couple of slides uh, to better understand this molecule. Now, the final example in protein um, folding or protein unfolding that I want to talk about is this really cool paper from the TANS lab published uh, in 2020. So instead of being interested in, in protein unfolding in that protein that's being tethered between the two beads, uh, they were interested in a protein called a heat shock protein um, or a chaperone protein that comes in and attempts to refold that protein. So this is important in diseases like Alzheimer's um, where protein aggregation can lead to diseases. And so researchers are really interested in understanding how does the cell um, or how do molecules act on these protein aggregates um, to, un, uh, to disaggregate them and then refold them. And so this is a video that the TANS lab actually made uh, to uh, highlight the findings of their paper. Like I said before, they were interested in understanding how these proteins aggregate and then how they are disaggregated. 
And so I believe in the next uh, sequence, uh, yes, so here's your heat shock protein. The structure of it is known, again, through things like cryo-EM. It has a helical structure with a pore in the middle. Uh, but up until this point, people didn't really understand how that pore-shaped structure resulted in the disaggregation um, of these coagulated proteins. So the authors of this paper, they took um, a protein of interest, they unfolded it using optical tweezers, uh, right? So it's tethered between those two beads that are used as handles. They then moved that tether into a channel with fluorescently labeled heat shock protein, and they began scanning along that protein, creating um, a chymograph like I've showed before. So here you'll see the background signal go up. This is then moving to a channel with a lot of this protein. They then see a single bonding event. They move out of this channel. And using both the biophysical parameters from the optical traps and the fluorescence imaging, they, are, they were able to observe the single molecule activity as this heat shock protein um, would try to refold the protein. And so how this worked is it would either pull on one side of the protein, the left or the right, or it would exhibit twice the velocity and pull both the left and the right at the same side. And what this allowed them to do then is build uh, a biophysical model of how the heat sh shock protein operates. And they speculated that the reason it can either pull just one side of the protein or two depends on how misfolded the protein is. So if the protein is completely misfolded, it pulls both uh, pieces of that protein off, freeing it up to go into the cell cytosol, and then allowing it to refold, probably with the help of other chaperone proteins. However, there might be cases where protein is only partially misfolded, as shown here. And if that's the case, then it only wants to pull one end of the protein, the misfolded part, uh, before releasing that protein so that it can be properly refolded. And so that was a really cool finding. Um, I don't want to go into any more details than that. I think the whole purpose of this talk is to just get you thinking about what you could do to benefit the research you're currently doing, even if that research uh, isn't necessarily single molecule research. So the second to last uh, topics I'll go into relate to cellular structure and transport. The first one here uh, has to do with studying viscoelastic properties of cytoskeletal filaments. So earlier I told you that you could string up uh, a single uh, biomolecule. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a paper from Science Advances where they were looking at uh, the vimentin. Uh, of a mentin fiber, which is a cytoskeletal intermediate filament. Uh, and they were interested in knowing if you pull this filament at different uh, forces, does it dissipate forces differently? Um, so you pull one of these optical traps out, you look at the force um, and the displacement or the strain of this mentin fiber. And you do this for varying um, rates. So anywhere from 50 nanometers to second, uh, 50 nanometers per second to almost two and a half microns per second. And what they found is if you look at the dissipation energy um, as a function of loading rate, you actually find that at higher loading rates, it dissipates more energy. This was a really fascinating finding because your intermediate filaments have always been thought to protect your cells from extreme stress. And indeed, this is what they're showing, right? If you um, hit your cell or a cell gets pushed on or is, or is um, perturbed in some way at a very high rate, it is likely these intermediate filaments that can dissipate that energy to protect the cell, similar to the way that your car protects you in a car accident, right? It, it absorbs a lot of that energy. Now, you're not uh, limited to being able to study individual filaments. You can actually study fibers that are cross-linked. Uh, so this is a paper that was recently published in Nature Communications, where they were looking at this protein anilin, which cross-links actin uh, microfilaments. Uh, anilin is known to be involved in cytokinetic constriction during cell division. However, it seemed to be myosin independent, uh, which is strange in the context of biological systems. And again, using both the biophysical <clears throat> uh, output from the optical tweezers, they were able to see that indeed um, this anilin can act on its own to create these like micro contractions um, that would lead to cytokinesis. For a lot of our cytoskeleton applications, uh, we actually use a slightly different workflow than what I've shown up until this point. 
that is working at the surface. Uh, so unlike the, the, the video I showed you before for forming DNA tethers and things in solution, here you would trap a bead in solution. You would then have your specimen, maybe microfilaments or cells on the surface, uh, and you would use a, a nano stage uh, to bring the surface up into contact with the bead. Um, and again, for applications like this, you typically use wide field or turf imaging. Again, turf is really good for surface level imaging. Um, and we also have something called IRM, which is interference uh, reflection microscopy. It's essentially like DIC uh, for turf. And so one of the traditional or one of the first uses for optical tweezers was actually to characterize the biophysical properties of motor proteins. So using that application workflow I just described, um, you would capture a bead that would be conjugated to a motor protein um, and then observe how that motor protein processes uh, along a filament at the surface. And so we've had a couple of really cool papers this year out of C. Travers at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, so yeah, this year published in JCB and Science Advances where they were studying kinesins. Uh, kinesins are critical for cargo transport along microtubules in cells. Uh, this is particularly important for neurons. So your neurons are the longest cells in your body, right? Um, and, you know, to move uh, a piece of cargo, you know, several, say, centimeters or longer, um, you need to have uh, fully functioning kinesin uh, motor proteins. As a result, uh, a lot of neurological disorders are tied uh, to mutations in these uh, kinesin proteins. These authors were particularly interested in studying uh, KIF-1A and KIF-5B, uh, particularly uh, because one is, uh, one is more likely to result in neurological disorders than the other. So when they looked at these wild-type proteins, KIF-1A and KIF-1B, what they found is that KIF-1B exhibits these fast, uh, low spikes in force uh, on the order of about two to three piganewtons whereas KIF-5B exerts uh, slow, steady, higher forces of about four piconewtons. So what does this biophysical information tell us? Uh, that KIF, uh, KIF-1A exhibits these fast, low forces. It's a, it's a very fast, processive motor, whereas KIF-5B um, has these uh, slow, processive movements. Uh, you know, maybe you could can make the analogy of like a race car versus an 18-wheeler. And when you put um, equivalent mutations into these two different variants of kinesin, you find that KIF-1A, its activity is completely abolished. It cannot perform its job. Whereas KIF-5B, while inhibited, can still perform its job and move cargo from one place uh, to another. And so it was this valuable information um, that can help researchers move, go on to develop therapeutics um, and treat these types of conditions. And finally, uh, you can also uh, use these uh, use optical tweezers uh, to probe the mechanics of cells themselves. So on the left here uh, was a brief study we worked uh, with researchers at the U University of Minnesota to do. Uh, we coded a bead uh, with a ligand of interest, and then we observed how that cell uh, adhered and pulled on that bead as it migrated by. Um, similarly, we've had researchers um, at Columbia University and elsewhere uh, coat beads uh, with other ligands of interest uh, to probe the surface of cells. So in this movie, you can see, uh, while you can't see the bead, you can actually see the two fluorescent markers in the cell as the bead is pulled away and it pulls a protrusion out. Uh, and of course, in the last year with this pandemic, we've actually seen a lot of interest of, in people wanting to study the viral uh, protein cell interactions related uh, to the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, virus. So with that, I just have a couple more slides to go through related to protein droplets and phase separation. Um, this is one of the, the newest fields we've seen emerge, uh, again, because liquid-liquid uh, phase separation is now becoming uh, a prominent, it's now becoming known that it's a prominent regulator of uh, cell organization and uh, regulation. So using the C-trap, you can do things like measure both the surface tension and the rheology of these condensates. Uh, for surface tension, here's a video uh, where you take a uh, phase-separated protein droplet, 
you trap two beads inside of it, and then you slowly stretch that protein uh, to determine the surface tension. And what you, what the researchers in this paper from 2018 did, it showed that with increasing salt concentrations, you can actually um, reduce the, the surface tension. So it stands to reason that a cell could use this, uh, this biophysical information uh, to modulate the behavior of these phase uh, or these uh, protein droplets in cells. Now, the second example here, uh, you can do use the same setup where you trap two beads instead of inside of a protein droplet. Uh, but instead of stretching that protein droplet until it essentially breaks, you actually uh, modulate the one bead back and forth at a fixed frequency. And you can measure the uh, viscoelastic properties or the uh, storage and loss modulus of the protein droplet. And again, you can look at how the salt concentration or how other variables um, alter the behavior of that protein droplet to better understand uh, the underlying biological uh, processes. Uh, finally, uh, we actually have multiple uh, papers on this from our customers, uh, but this is just one here from 2019 on biomolecules where they trap these droplets directly. So you're not using things like polystyrene or glass beads. And then you move these droplets together at a fixed rate to measure how fast they fuse. Um, in this example, I, I can't remember the protein off the top of my head, but they were studying it in the process of, of PEG or polyethylene glycol. And they found uh, that as you add PEG, uh, since it is sort of this uh, hydrophobic molecule, it actually prevents uh, it prevents fusion. And while it's not shown here, you can also uh, use utilize multicolor uh, fluorescence. So we've had people both look at the fusion of protein droplets uh, between two different molecules, such as uh, say positively charged proteins and negatively charged nucleic acids, um, to watch the structure as those fuse. Uh, and then you can also do things like FRAP uh, to look at the local dynamics within these droplets um, to understand how the proteins are moving around. So with that, uh, it covers the four major uh, applications that we see researchers use. Uh, I, the goal, again, was to get you thinking of how you could use this technology in your research. Um, but essentially, you can be as creative as you would like um, to tackle the problems uh, most relevant to you. Now, what makes Lumix different than your typical microscopy companies is that we want to support you. And, um, you know, maybe a year ago, we could have said that we were a dedicated team of single molecule experts. That's still true. Uh, but now we have a team of cell biologists and people from other fields. And uh, it, it, it becomes a very powerful resource uh, to address the assays that you would like to do. We're stretched ac across the globe from Amsterdam to Beijing to San Francisco to Boston, uh, which enables us to provide you with 24-7 support. And then we also have people to help you with your data analysis um, and experimental design. Uh, we love to host on-site trainings and annual service scenes, and we love to do workshops in summer schools. Uh, for example, I was personally just at uh, Woods Hole in Massachusetts about um, a month ago. Uh, where we worked with the physiology course, uh, and it was a lot of fun. And so to make your researcher research faster, easier, and more reliable, we've launched things such as uh, our new reagents, kits, and services, as well as something uh, that's called a script sharing and protocol platform. I just want to take a couple of slides to acknowledge what those are. So maybe you've watched this presentation, and you're thinking, this is really cool. Um, I really want to study kinesin motors, or I really want to study how this um, protein repairs DNA, but this field is new to me. Uh, to make it easier for you, we have launched kits in all of these fields, and many of these kits can be customized to match your needs. Uh, we want to see you um, do these cool experiments. And then finally, uh, I'm not, I'll just start this video um, just to show you the screenshot here. Our instrument is, uh, it's like your traditional microscope. Um, it has custom-made software, but what's really cool is that you can automate every feature using Python. Um, and then you can also use things like Python and MATLAB to analyze the data. And so if you're someone who is a great programmer, you can upload scripts that you use onto our script sharing platform, 
But if you're a, a novice, uh, someone who's less comfortable or maybe new, or maybe you're someone who sees a really cool paper and you're and you want to do those same exact experiments, um, you can likely find the scripts they used on our website. Um, it really creates uh, transparency and clarity in the way researchers are, are performing their work um, and everybody benefits from it. So with that, I hope this presentation um, has given you an appreciation for, for studying dynamic single molecule processes. Specifically, I hope you've realized that it's a great tool for bridging these um, structural and compositional tools like cryo-EM, uh, X-ray crystallography, or even CHIP with these functional assays um, related to live cell imaging, um, running Western, um, things like that. And finally, I just want to give a shout out to our recently launched product, uh, second product. So the C-Trap has been around for many years now, but we are a company that is dedicated to bringing really cool cutting edge biophysical tools um, to researchers in a way that was never before possible. Um, and last year, we, we launched this technology called the Z-Movi that enables you to look at cell binding avidity, uh, which is the overall strength of interactions between two different cells. And it's been a very exciting time because we've seen a lot of pharmaceutical companies uh, that are investigating CAR T cell therapies uh, want to obtain our instrument or have obtained our instrument. So if that's something related to your research, feel free to check out our website to learn more. But as far as that, I appreciate everyone's attention. Um, thank you uh, for attending, and I would be happy to take any questions if there are any. And thank you, Dr. Gates, for sharing your time and knowledge with our attendees. Attendees, if you are interested in other Office of Research events, please visit our website, research.utdallas.edu, or follow us on Twitter at UTD Research. Thank you very much for joining us today.